So today we'll talk about um, the search uh, approach to, uh, to the labor markets. It'll be our first introduction to, to motivating um, search, both non-sequential and sequential search. <clears throat> so I'll start by summarizing uh, last week's uh, lecture, and then I'll make some final remarks <clears throat> with respect to the Mortens and Pizzeridis model, um, just by way of uh, review, and then I will jump into the microeconomic foundations of uh, search theory, a very simple non-sequential search problem. Uh, there are many uh, developments in this area even today uh, that I won't talk about, micro foundations of uh, certain types of uh, matching functions, for example, and the like. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that to, to uh, more advanced courses. And then I'll give I use this as an introduction to sequential search, which is the idea of being able to um, uh, proceed in the search process through time um, and rejecting or accepting offers uh, in a dynamic, in a dynamically optimal way. <clears throat> Before I do that, let's uh, review what Mortensen and Pissarides was all about. Um, we discovered that by allowing the quality or the productivity of the match to change um, exogenously um, led to some interesting insights as to the costs of and benefits of having a match and, and posting vacancies. And that gives rise to a, an endogenous uh, separation rate, which is useful. So already MP um, is a useful setup for thinking about um, intriguing questions of labor market policy <clears throat> and the rest, because many of these institutions um, have effects that are not uh, black and white. They actually have, um, often have ambiguous effects. For example, job protection um, in the sense of imposing a tax on firing um, has um, ambiguous effects. It will reduce the amount of um, of the number of vacancies posted at any um, level of unemployment, but it'll also uh, reduce the amount of severance because it's costly to do so. So to find out the answer, you need to use calibration and simulation um, of well-specified models. Nevertheless, we've learned from the mortensen Pissarini setup that you can, you can learn a lot. We showed that uh, in, the, in 1999, the, the famous uh, <coughs> Uh, handbook chapter of, of, of Mortensen and Pissarini showed that if you, if you were to give the U.S. the labor market institutions of um, Europe, uh, it would lead to a higher rate of unemployment and a lower rate of job destruction. But um, and similarly, if the Europeans adopted American institutions, uh, unemployment would be lower. Back in the day, uh, unemployment in Europe was a big issue. Of course, now 20 years later, things have. Um, have looked a lot more favorable, have become a lot more favorable for, for workers, and unemployment is e lower even in countries like Spain and, uh, and Greece. Okay, there were a lot of critiques of this model that um, we alluded to in earlier lectures. One is the famous uh, Hall-Scheimer critique. Uh, Scheimer um, <coughs> simulated a uh, simple v version of the MP model and found that <coughs> the quantities that are relevant in this model, meaning unemployment and vacancies, uh, um, are just um, a lot more volatile <coughs> in the data than they are in, in the model. So um, and this is true across time as well as across sectors. So the, the, the MP model seems to be missing the, the target here, predicting um, much more uh, much more fluctuation of the wage and much less fluctuation of, of unemployment and vacancies. Um, Hall <coughs> also showed that um, this is due to the, the assumption of, of, of Nash bargaining at the match level, meaning that the wage would move um, much more <coughs> than it would actually uh, in the data. And this would almost mechanically lead to to uh, lower, uh, flick, lower volatility of, of vacancy posting and this, therefore less um, 
volatility of unemployment. So one easy way to fix this was be, would be to somehow introduce uh, a type of wage rigidity, some sort of backward dependence of the real wage or some sort of um, <clears throat> ad hoc inflexibility. This would mean departing from the, uh, from the assumption of Nash bargaining, which many find to be quite attractive. Um, other authors have thought um, of other in creative ways to increase um, wage rigidity without violating the <clears throat> the microeconomic foundations. And one way of doing this would be simply to, um, to restrict the, the zone of, of agreement, uh, in other words, the distance between the, the, the fallback position of the worker and the fallback position of the firm. And if you make that tight enough, then the wage, almost by construction, can't move too much. And that leads to, a, to an automatic solution to the problem. <coughs> Many have found this solution to be a bit, a bit ad hoc and somewhat um, contrived. So um, anyway, you can do this. There are other bargaining models that have, le have also led to, to less uh, volatility of wages that can also solve the problem. Um, of course, another critique of, of Morton Spiserides is that the labor supply problem of the household is, is somewhat simplified because households cannot leave the labor force uh, but this is easily solved, and Pissarides does this, in, I think, in chapter seven of his, of his textbook. And of course, the bargaining problem and wage determination look different if, indeed, the firm um, has more than one worker, and workers are naturally at a bargaining disadvantage with respect to, to the employer. This could also lead to more <coughs> wage rigidity if the worker um, can be threatened with, with um, being fired or being um, <clears throat> playing one worker off the other. Um, this sort of um, outcome could lead to a type of rigidity in the in the wage. <clears throat> so there are many ways to improve on the general thrust of the MP model. Kahuk uh, uh, and Postlevine have, have d introduced different types of 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 <clears throat> jobs or labor markets, and um, Den Han et al. also looked at um, starting the job uh, at a productivity less than uh, one, possibly, as or as a draw from a random distribution. This would <clears throat> does not change much qualitatively, but certainly may be easier to calibrate. You can endogenize labor force participation, as, as mentioned already. I've worked on a <clears throat> on models where we try to substitute the Nash um, uh, f at the firm level to have some sort of large um, employers association or labor union in the spirit of Euro European uh, labor market institutions. What I'm going to do now is going to move into this micro foundations of what search <clears throat> is all about. Excuse me. So to do this, we're going to have to think hard about uh, the micro economic decision of accepting or rejecting a wage and what it means to do so, what it means to, to search. Um, there are fundamentally many different ways to, to think of the search process. Search means there's an incompleteness of information. Uh, if information were not complete, then you'd find in zero time the ideal job for your lifetime. But Information is not freely available. Information may be changing over time. <clears throat> the world may not even be stationary. So to do this, we need to think about the stochastic environment. We need to think about <clears throat> randomness. And we think about random numbers. And the most important random number will be uh, the wage that one is offered. So in the, in the sense of, of uh, <clears throat> search theory that evolved in the 1960s and 70s, you can think of the wage <clears throat> as being a, um, a draw from a distribution and therefore being a random number and possibly from a, a time invariant distribution um, and basically using simple ideas from probability theory to, to think hard about what optimal behavior would be appropriate under these conditions. So we need to think about <clears throat> these concepts that, um, that you've all been familiarized with in your statistics courses. 
So we'll think of a random number. We'll think of a density function that describes the, the, um, the probability um, density defined on the support of the, the random variable. We'll be thinking generally about positive or non-negative random variables. Um, <clears throat> general think about non-negative ran random variables. The notion of being a wage could not be negative, but it could certainly be, um, be zero. <clears throat> and the zero wage might correspond to, to simply not getting any uh, uh, offer at all. <clears throat> so we have, um, we'll need to use operations like integration to find out what the cumulative um, distribution function looks like. And I'll review those things quickly. If we let F <clears throat> define the, the density of P over a support of possible values, and we'll take the non-negative uh, interval, closed interval going up to, the, to a maximum price. Um, and again, we can, we'll change this notation in subsequent lectures to think about wages, but we'll think about the price now. Then the CDF is simply um, the integral from zero to P of the, uh, the function F integrated over a dummy variable S. So the variable S will often be a dummy variable of integration or S prime. We'll make that clear in subsequent uh, slides. Therefore, we can think of an expected value as, um, as an integral. So the expected value, the, the, um, the mean of a, of a random variable is simply the, the product of the, the value of the random variable times its density. Um, and this integral is, is taken over the, the support of the, uh, of the distribution. Okay, and we'll use different notation. We'll often, instead of uh, f of p dp, we'll use uh, df cap f p um, as a shorthand. Okay, so that's a <clears throat> an important thing. We'll also be able to show that for non-negative random variables that the expected value of P is also equal to the interval of one minus the cumulative um, density distribution function of P uh, over the integral, um, the same integral. That's a very e easy demonstration. Integration by parts, you'll do it in the section. <clears throat> Make sure you know how to do that. It's very important for, for what will follow when we think about uh, wages. But right now we're going to take the Stigler um, the, the Stigler approach to, to thinking about search, which is the, was the first, um, first attempt in the early 1960s to think about information economics and, and what it means to know something um, and not to know something and how to, to formulate a, uh, an expectation of a random variable and how that would influence um, behavior. So George Stickler thought about this in, in 1961 and 62 and published some very important papers on this. Um, and I'm just going to motivate it by thinking about, um, not about wages, but thinking about the price that you would pay <clears throat> for some good. Think of a, a kilogram of, of cheese at, um, at a famous market where there is no centralized source of information. So to find to find out the price of cheese at any particular cheese stand, you need to visit it. So we'll assume that cheese is identical. Um, of course, this can be expanded to include uh, non-pecuniary benefits or costs of taking or buying a certain type of cheese. We'll just subsume this into the price. And the only thing that would co counter spending all day at the Nollendorf Platz would be the fact that every time you you go to visit a cheese stand, you have to, you have to pay some sort of cost, which involves uh, effort, shoe leather, um, time, whatever. Okay, so this is the, the basic Stigler approach. Um, the, the question is, what does the consumer want to do? The consumer wants to minimize uh, the expected cost. So, so presume that the consumer has Leontief preferences over the cheese, will buy one unit of cheese in any case, um, but the question is, um, how can you minimize costs? Uh, you you want to pay the lowest possible price, and to find out what the price is, you have to visit a stand, and every time you visit a stand, you have to pay C. So if each stand offers 
a price as a draw from a distribution um, from, from a, the density, um, a random variable with density little f, <clears throat> then we can think of the, um, the expected value of visiting one stand, and then we can think of the expected value of, of visiting several stands, but in fact, Stickler's um, insight was that you want to choose the minimum price. So if you choose, if you visit four stands, you'll have four chances to get a low price, and you will take the lowest price. You'll sample these, um, and his idea was to do this simultaneously. Um, of course, he wasn't really spending a whole lot of time thinking hard about this, but you can't do that in real life. You have to visit one stand at a time. So I think his, his conceptualization of this problem was you get to the Nondorf Platz too early, the chief stands haven't opened yet, you sit in a cafe and you write down um, the mathematical problem, how can I minimize my costs to get my one kilogram of cheese and visit um, the number of stands that maximizes the, ex the, the expected utility or minimizes the expected costs of buying that one piece of cheese. Okay, so it's, it's a bit more complicated than just taking the, uh, the expected value. You want to take the expected value of the random variable, which is the lowest price um, of the n stands that you visit. So it's, a, it's an extreme value problem. Okay, so the, formally uh, you're sitting at the cafe and you write down this problem. You're choosing the, the, the integer number of visits. Um, so you're choosing N, capital N, and N implies a value for this um, minimal price, and you can take an expectation of that price, and you also know that if you choose to visit N stands, you're gonna have to pay NC um, in shoe leather costs, visiting costs, whatever. So because this is an integer problem, we can't use calculus um, although you could probably make an abstract version of this where n is some sort of intensity of, of, of search. But in fact, um, it, it works much better to think about it in terms of, of integers. So we can actually um, think about the, the gain of visiting another stand. But before we do that, we have to decide what the expected value is of this um, total cost. Because oh, after the fact, you may decide to visit five stands and you pay five times C costs and then you get an expected value which is the minimum value of the price of cheese um, of the five sampled stands. Okay, so in this mind of, in Stigler's mind you could visit these, um, these stands and, and I guess as you're walking from one place to the next you could store it. You could, you could imagine it's simultaneous search but in reality Back then, they didn't have, uh, uh, they had walkie-talkies, but they didn't have uh, cell phones, so you'd have to really literally go from one stand to the next. Um, Stigler, in Stigler's mind, basically, you would have uh, an expected value of this, this, extreme, um, va this extreme value of the price of given n draws. Okay, so we need to derive what that is. This is called non-sequential search. So, so Stigler was not uh, giving, uh, the searcher for the cheese a chance to, to sit down and re-optimize or think about um, things. So think of the, 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 um, the consumer sitting in the, the, the cafe and writing down this plan. Uh, well, one way of thinking about it is that the plan actually gets executed in real time. The other is that the, this is non-sequential search. In other words, there's the, the sequence of events doesn't matter, and um, there's no discovery involved at each draw, and therefore um, you can think of this as happening simultaneously. So it's not exactly what we think about when we think about search, and that's why this theory was criticized, but in any case, it's a, it's a starting point. So you write down the number of stands you're gonna visit, and then you do it, um, either simultaneously or um, you know, you run through the, the um, <clears throat> you run through the stands, and you can have recall. So you can actually say, okay, well, I, I got a really low price at the first stand, and I can go back and, and get that. 
Okay, so it's, it's clearly a little bit of a, um, it's a bit of a stretch. So we, we like to call this non-sequential search to rule out uh, discussion of that, of that issue, but that's gonna be the most important issue in the end. Okay, so let's define this random variable, call it pmin, which is simply the minimum um, value of a, of a vector um, of n prices that I've drawn. So having drawn those prices, which one is the, is the least? Now that is a random variable in itself, but it's not um, a convention, it can't be conventionally analyzed using f uh, without thinking hard about what it means to choose the minimum value. And to do that, it might be worth thinking about the following random variable. The probability, uh, thinking of the, the, the random variable described by um, the minimum price, which is the probability of drawing n random prices, and each one of those is, is indicated by a, with a subscript, but none of those being less than p. Okay, so this is kind of the problem that we've, we talked about already, extreme value problem. So, you know, integrating by parts told us that the, the probability density of a random number that is no less than um, p is equal to 1 minus the cumulative. Okay, and the, the probability that neither of these two random variables is less than p is actually equal to the product of those two. So the probability that both draws are greater than p is equal to one minus f of p squared. Okay, and you can extend that to think about n draws, the probability of the lowest price of n independent draws from this distribution, um, the probability that the lowest is exceeding p is going to be 1 minus f of p raised to the nth power. Okay, so the density attached to the event, no price less than p is 1 minus f of p raised to the nth power. So taking over the support of all the prices that can be drawn, the mean of this distribution is the expected value um, it's going to be given by the expression the integral over 1 minus f of p raised to the nth power. Okay, so Stigler basically took this, inserted it into the expected value, and thought about, since I'm sitting at the cafe uh, writing down the problem, trying to think of what the, the right number of cheese stands to visit, um, I'm actually asking what value of n gives me a minimum value of that expression? Million, minimum value of the expected price um, plus the costs implied by invi visiting um, n cheese stands. That would be n times c. Okay, so we could, we could basically think of a comparison of the expected price having visited n and the expected price of having visited n plus one. Okay, so the gain uh, in this problem is simply the, the benefit of, of a decline in expected price by visiting an additional stand. Uh, again, ex ante, before you actually visit any stands at all, uh, would be this difference. And that can be, rewrite, can be rewritten as, as um, minus uh, the integral of f times one minus f of p um, raised to the nth power. <clears throat> integrated over the entire support of the price distribution. This is always gonna be negative, so sitting at the cafe uh, table, deciding what, how many n, deciding on n the number of tables to visit, uh, the number of stands to visit, <laughs> um, clearly any increase in n is gonna reduce the expected price, which will be a gain, but again, the, um, the searcher has to pay uh, the search costs. And this does so at a declining rate. So you can think of the right thing to do would be to choose n star, which would be the number of visits to cheese stands from the perspective of not having um, a chance to visit any yet. And this would simply satisfy the condition that the cost of an additional stand can, no, can be no greater than the, um, it can be no, it, it will be less than um, the gain that you had from the, 
from visiting n star, and it would be greater than the gain from visiting n star plus one. So the n star that satisfies that condition will be the optimal number of visits. So you're sitting at the, the cafe table, you decide I'm gonna visit n star cheese stands, the, the market's open, and you go off and do your, your business. So the, 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 key, the key thing to, to understand is that this is, cannot be optimal policy if you have to visit the cheese stands in a, in a sequential way that depend on, on, on time. And this is simply because it's just not time consistent, <laughs> okay? Because you might choose an N star, um, and if you start visiting sequentially the, the stands, you might get a very, very low price in, the, in one search in, after one visit. And, it, and you, I mean, in the case, uh, in the extreme case, what if you got the cheese was just given to you for free? What would you do? Well, you'd take it and you'd say thank you and you'd, you wouldn't continue to search because you've already got the best possible price you could imagine. So we say that this type of policy in over time, in a time context, uh, cannot be time consistent. Okay, so the policy that you, you wrote down at the table as soon as you start to execute it, you may uh, encounter a situation where you regret having chosen in star because you, if you have to search another n star minus one times, so you have to pay C and you're not getting any game because you've already, you've already got your, your lowest possible price. So you should stop. Okay, and this is not allowed for in Stigler's um, search search approach. So if anything, Stigler has to be relevant for non-sequential search. When you, maybe you're in the internet, you're deciding how many bots to send out to look for the, the best price on different websites, or you visit, you apply for a job simultaneously, um, uh, or put in an offer for a, a piece of art in several different auctions simultaneously uh, in a way that's independent of, of the, the passage of time, that would still be a, a decent model for thinking about uh, this kind of problem. But for the problems that Stigler was thinking about, namely a labor, labor um, market participant looking for a job and visiting different employers in a sequential fashion, this is the wrong model. And this was the critique that both McCall and Mortensen in 1970 in separate papers actually um, called out and, and criticized. Okay, so this, this lack of time consistency means that if we think of search as occurring over time, this cannot be the right model uh, for thinking about it. Anytime we have sequential search processes, we'll want to um, worry about the fact that after, um, it, may, it just may be uh, a for reasonable searcher, it may be after getting a low price, it doesn't have to be the zero price, any low price, is unlikely to be to be bettered in subsequent visits, and it would make sense just to terminate search. This cannot be optimal behavior. So McCall and Mortensen, in their separate contributions, um, <clears throat> stressed this uh, this notion of of time inconsistency, and of course, discounting can also accelerate this this uh, impatience can accelerate um, the um, the, the role of, of, of search, um, of, of, of the role of time in search and the fact that time, time in fact, is, is money. <clears throat> um, both of these people, um, McCall and Mortensen, stressed the recursive nature of the problem, which is gonna be a, a, a sort of a, a constant theme in the rest of the course, which is thinking about uh, the fact that <clears throat> Whatever policy you wrote down in a cafe, um, if it's a policy, it depends on the offer that arrives at any particular time, and then the searcher makes a decision, should I go forward, uh, should I stop? So it's an optimal stopping problem. Um, and it turns out that um, the discounting is not crucial for this. It's actually, what's crucial is that every search step costs something, so there has to be some sort of some sort of cost of search or some, and you can think of this cost of search as a friction, as, a, um, as some sort of barrier to, to having complete information, 
to having complete access to all the, the details, because if you had all the details, you'd, you'd have a perfect match from the very beginning. Okay, so if you look in Sargent's uh, book um, in the 1980s, or Lundqvist and Sargent, uh, their macroeconomic, recursive macroeconomic theory, both have extremely uh, elegant derivations of what, what I'm gonna show you right now. So this, think of this as an introduction to sequential search, and keeping in mind with the, uh, keeping in mind the Nolendorf Platz problem, so the, the problem of, of searching the cheese market. Um, uh, keep in mind that we'll eventually flip the the problem to start thinking about looking for a job. Of course, for the cheese uh, searcher, the idea is to get the minimum the minimum cost, total cost of of, of being at the market. Uh, whereas a worker in the job market want to maximize the net of search costs um, income that the, the, the worker would eventually have an expected value over time. And that would be the, 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 uh, the common motif of the, of the rest of the course. But we'll stick with the, the minimum price problem just for the rest of the hour. So think of the consumer now sitting at Nondorf Platz, but wants to minimize the expected value of price ne net of search costs but in the sense of <clears throat> the spirit of sequential search will allow for the consumer or the, the, um, the, the, the market um, customer to, to cease searching at, at any point in the process, okay? And because the, process, the, the model is, is designed to have sort of a, a fairly time invariant characteristic, we'll assume that every stand has the same property in terms of the, the, the random um, variable that's being drawn, the price of the cheese. There's, um, there's no directed search. You don't visit certain stands because you know them. Uh, there's, you have complete information. <clears throat> it's really all about thinking what should I do with this offer I've got in hand? Should I accept it or should I continue search? Okay, and that's the way, that's the way um, we're gonna think about this problem. So in fact, sitting at the table, you're not choosing N, you're choosing a policy. And the policy will be a pair um, of, of objects that characterize optimal, optimal behavior. One will be the value of the problem to the searcher given an offer in hand, and we'll use, use S uh, because S will be a dummy variable and often the, um, a variable integration to stand for the price because the random variable price um, is on the interval from zero to P upper bar. We'll use S as the, as the, the current draw, um, candidate draw. And given that candidate draw, the, the problem has a value in terms of expected minimum um, cost of, of search, and there's a reservation price. A reservation pr price is, is denoted as S bar, or S upper bar, and that is the price below which uh, you will accept the offer and walk away from the market, you've made your purchase, and you can go home. Okay, so now we have a, we have a, a a pair of objects that solve the following problem. It's, a, it's the definition of what V is. V is the minimized value um, given the price in hand um, and the minimization takes place not over a continuous variable but rather accept or reject and either I accept um, the offer S and if I reject I have a, an expected value of the problem, which is given by V, which is already on the left-hand side, okay, so this is, um, this is what we, we, we would call a Bellman equation, plus C. C is the cost of postponing my decision or rejecting the cost, the cost of rejecting, because I really need that cheese. I'm gonna get that cheese eventually, but if I, if I turn down S, I'm gonna go back into the market and visit another stand and pay C. So I have to pay C with certainty, okay? So this minimization um, occurs except to reject. Basically, I have to evaluate um, this object, and the, evalu the evaluation involves the 
very function that's on the left-hand side. So it's the, the notion of having to, to go back into the, into the milling, the crowd of, of consumers and, and draw another um, um, offer uh, of the cheese price distribution. Okay, think of this um, fancy E as the expectations operator as before, okay? So we think of V as, uh, as the valuation of the problem. It's the, it's the actual minimized value going forward of, 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 of the, the cost I'm going to face, um, given that I've got this S in hand. So I could, I could accept it, OK? I could accept S. Um, but if I reject it and go back into the, into the, into the mill, basically there must be some reason for doing that. Maybe the price will be lower than, than S um, <clears throat> with, with high probability. But I also have to consider that the next, the next step will cost, again, C. So you see, I'm not choosing N anymore. I'm choosing, basically, whether I should keep going or not. So that's the, that's the, the, genius, uh, the ingenious aspect of this, of this setup. So think of this as the, the minimum price I can, I can get, basically, given that I could pay S, or I could pay C and continue to search depending on whether um, S is less than or greater than S bar, the reservation uh, price. Okay, so we, we write this um, formally as basically the, the value of, of search in some sense is the minimum of what I've got in hand and what I think I can get by paying C and going back in and, and looking for another draw. So note carefully that the, the bounds of integration are 0 to P upper bar. And the dummy variable of integration is S prime. So we're thinking of all the different possible values of, of, of the price that I could get, ranging from 0 to P upper bar. Um, and the valuation of those draws will be using the same function that is defined by this Bellman equation. <clears throat> so the Bellman equation is a functional equation that defines the value function. And it's defined on the support of f. And it can't be um, decreasing. So higher values of s can't devalue decrease the value of the program uh, because it's a stationary model. Every visit involves the same distribution function. And we're trying to minimize this object. Now, if you think about the wage problem that we'll be do dealing with next week, uh, the objective is, is to maximize expected income under different conditions. Either I get the job forever or I have to deal with some probability of losing my job. Here we're talking about minimizing. OK, so the, the second part of this optimal policy, this pair of the function and S upper bar, S upper bar is called the reservation price. So the, the Bellman equation characterizes optimal policy. Um, and the idea would be that this reservation price is sufficient to define your optimal behavior. If, if the next draw involves, or any draw involves S less than S upper bar, then you accept it. You got a better, you got a good deal. And if it's higher, you reject and continue to, um, to search. OK, so writing the dependence of f on s prime is just a, using um, this dummy variable notation um, to remind you that um, before we were talking about, I mean, you have an s in hand. And then you've got to basically deal with the fact that if you reject, you're going to have to go back into the, into the mix and, and pull another, another random variable having paid the cost C. So you know, if C is, um, is high, then you, you're probably going to be a little bit uh, likely to, to accept the, the, the offer in hand. So um, I already mentioned the non-decreasing um, nature The indifference property, so 
there'll be a, a critical value of S um, that I can draw above which I'll um, reject and below which I will accept. And we can simply eliminate this V um, and write S as a function of, of the known parts of this problem just by breaking into, into two pieces because being a monotone function, we'll always reject offers of um, the price that are above S upper bar and we'll always re accept them if they're below S upper bar. We can use integration by parts to, to evaluate that. So let's rewrite that indifference condition using um, the fact that um, if you just multiply and divide, uh, multiply both sides of the definition of, of um, the integral of the derivative of, of a CDF or the density, the integral of the density has to be equal to one. And then you can just break it into the part that we call the rejection region and the acceptance region. Okay, but first let's just insert that into the, into the condition. And we can write um, as follows. And then, again, breaking the, um, the, the, um, the support of, P, uh, of the price into um, two regions, the acceptance region, zero to S upper bar, and the rejection region, S bar to P upper bar. And then we can just evaluate logically what those two have to be. The second term has to be equal to zero because um, by definition, I, I continue to, um, to search. Okay, so um, the left-hand side determines the story. And then we just have to evaluate this, this integral taken over all values of S prime in the acceptance region. Now, if you integrate that expression, um, you can use integration by parts to evaluate that expression. And then you can show that the left-hand side is simply equal to the integral from zero to S upper bar of F of <clears throat> S prime dS. And therefore, the reservation price is simply the solution to the this problem, which is, it's the left-hand side is determined by the, dis the distribution um, of the price um, across these markets, and they're all the same, so there's no temporal dependence of, of the distribution of the price, um, the random draw of price um, with respect to time, um, and you see that the, the V function has disappeared. So we've eliminated the V function from this problem. Think of the left-hand side as the gain of an extra draw at reservation price S upper bar. And the, the right-hand side is the cost of an extra draw. So the optimal choice of the reservation price S upper bar would have to satisfy that condition. And remember, C is constant. We assume that, that uh, C is constant. Um, constant cost of an extra extra visit to a stand. Okay, so we can, we can define the left-hand side as a function g, which is a function of this um, reservation price, and it's an increasing function. In fact, it's a convex function of S upper bar. Okay, and it would look like this. And think of it as the when the consumer is deciding um, what reservation price to set, it basically understands that the being really choosy um, has its costs, and being uh, less choosy, meaning higher, having a higher reservation price, in this case, would be um, um, also has has its costs, and um, the the gain of being a little bit choosy gets, gets more and more attractive as you become more and more desperate. So there's a, there's a certain um, you know, nice uh, convexity in this, in this function. Now because this problem is defined uh, given the CDF, the CDF 
can have all sorts of forms. It could be, think of the normal cumulative distribution function. Um, it doesn't have a closed form, so it's, um, it's basically, you need numerical methods often to solve these problems. Um, for demonstration purposes, maybe using the, 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 um, the uniform distribution um, with a linear um, CDF would be an interesting way of just fixing ideas, but in general, closed forms don't exist and you have to use numerical methods uh, to solve them. But you can use comparative static analysis that we've done in other, other contexts to ask what happens if I change some parameter of the problem, what happens to the, um, to the endogenous variable implied by the exogenous variation, and that would be the reservation price um, for the good involved. And you can show just by taking a total derivative and solving for ds upper bar dc, um, you can show that um, the um, reservation price um, increases with search costs, as you would imagine. The more costly it is to visit different cheese stands, uh, the more, um, the less choosy you're going to be, and you're just going to take what you can get, um, <clears throat> become less choosy. And you can show that um, an increase in the means preserving spread um, makes you more interested in being choosy. So if um, you want to have an opportunity to take advantage of those lower prices that may have evolved. But mean preserving spread would mean that many more prices would be um, uh, less attractive. So you become, an, a, you know, an increase in the mean preserving spread would, would make you uh, more likely to try to hold out for a lower, lower price offer. And um, a distribution shift to a, to a stochastically um, dominant distribution, call it G, uh, would make you less likely uh, to be choosy because the entire shift of the distribution would involve higher prices um, and make you more desperate. Okay, so there's a nice diagrammatic way of thinking about this problem. It's just simply plotting uh, the value function for various uh, values of S. So remember, S is the draw. V is the, um, the value function that obeys the Bellman equation. And we've already shown that that has a very nice uh, form that it eliminates the, um, I mean, we, we have the, the notion of the, the the value function itself is, um, is a piecewise linear function because if you have a draw that's greater than S upper bar, you just, um, um, the, the value of um, continued search is gonna be S upper bar. Um, but if you choose, a, if, you, if you draw a value of, of V that's less than S upper bar, then of course, going forward, the value of that is equal to the price itself because you um, haven't yet paid again the search costs of moving forward. So this piecewise linear interpretation gives us um, a nice way of finding the value of this, of this problem. It's gonna be a 45 degree line from the origin and it's gonna intersect um, and um, the, the only thing we have to find out is what is, what is the value of S over bar and we know how to do that by uh, applying the formula already derived before. Okay, so we just need to know what the distribution is. In this simple model, we can find the reservation price. <clears throat> okay, so we're done for now. Um, most important things we dealt with were random variables. Um, um, think of search involving, um, and next week we'll look at uh, the wage is a random variable, so every visit to an employer results in a, in a, in a wage offer. Here, thinking about a, the opportunity of buying cheese at a, at a marketplace, uh, sampling prices from identical stands, uh, thinking of those as random variables. Um, the density function would describe the, um, 
this random variable and the, the restriction of density functions we're familiar with. They have to integrate uh, to one and they allow us to, to compute expected values and for non-negative uh, random variables we can use that function, that, um, that alternative um, expected value formula which is the integral of one minus f um, of the random variable um, p dp. And then um, we can you know, use integration, integration by parts to derive the CDF as I already said. And then we can use this to think of the non-sequential uh, search problem, meaning that if, we, if we're honest about this, we shouldn't uh, think of this as a model where you um, expend time, um, but rather you decide simultaneously a uh, number of um, draws to to engage in or to, 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 to undertake or simultaneous interviews, which are not exactly possible, but in a world where of the internet, it might be possible to have simultaneous applications for a job, but um, the weakness of the Stigler approach was in the day, they used his model to think of um, sequential search, which led to this time consistency problem that we talked about already. <clears throat> If you do the Stigler approach, you're thinking about an extreme value, so you're thinking about the expected value of the lowest um, draw um, given n draws, and that's why it really is non-sequential because if there were a sequential aspect, you would you'd probably try to cheat and take the, you know, maybe <laughs> uh, take a, a low value, accept it, and just stop searching, but. You, in this model, you can't uh, save on search costs. It's all decided at the same time. So that's the, I mean, I think, I think it's important to remember the, despite the critique of, of Stigler's approach, it's, it's a valid way of thinking about non-sequential search, simultaneous search, um, where no option is given to, to renege or to, um, to cancel the, um, the, the policy that was decided on. And we can think about ex expected gains as the way of defining this optimal search policy and uh, balancing that against the, the search costs would give you the, the so-called uh, optimal number of search steps. Um, but because all these, prob these problems we talked about applying this to sequential search, we really need to think about sequential search more seriously. We think about a value function, a reservation price, and uh, in the course of the, the rest of this course, we'll talk about thinking about the employee's decision, the unemployed worker's decision in, uh, in terms of the number of uh, uh, steps or interviews or the amount of job effort, uh, sorry, um, search effort that's expended um, to, optim to maximize expected uh, um, income moving forward. Okay, so I'm finished. Thanks for your attention and uh, look forward to seeing you next week.